The gospel for this, and actually for every Reformation Sunday, is from the Gospel of St. John, chapter 8. Then Jesus said to the Jews who had believed in him, If you continue in my word, you are truly my disciples, you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. They answered him, We are descendants of Abraham and have never been slaves to anyone. What do you mean by saying, You will be made free? Jesus answered them, Very truly I tell you, everyone who commits sin is a slave to sin. The slave does not have a permanent place in the household. The son has a place there forever. So if the son makes you free, you will be free indeed. The gospel of our Lord. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and our Savior on this fine Reformation Sunday. Amen. We hold that a person is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. That is the word that broke into the world through the ministry of Martin Luther, launching the Reformation so long ago. It was a word that shocked the world then and still shocks the world today. For who ever heard of such a thing? That a person is made right with God just by being still and listening to the announcement, you are just for Jesus' sake. Strange words. Who needs them? Maybe when people were actually trying to save themselves by doing good works, justification by faith was good news. But who is trying anymore? All the incentives to get people to behave properly no longer function. Heaven does not attract and hell does not threaten. Suggesting to the horror of some that we can no longer afford the language of the Reformation. Is there not something more relevant to say? Before we go any further, we need to pause and take notice of something very important. It is God's word. It isn't that we need this word to be spoken. But as St. Paul put it, this was to show God's righteousness, to prove at the present time that he himself is righteous and that God justifies the one who has faith in Jesus Christ. You are just for Jesus' sake, not merely for your sake, for Jesus' sake. It's God's cause. God's decision. God's deciding to show his righteousness whether you think you need it or not. The words intend to do what God's word always does. To create out of nothing to call something new into being, to start a reformation. So listen up. Yet because of sin, we never really think we need these words. The conversation between Jesus and those who believed in him 
is a clear indication of that. If you continue in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. But, but, they said, we aren't in bondage. We are descendants of Abraham. We're not slaves of anyone. What's this promise of freedom? Who needs it? Ah, freedom. Just to speak the word is to enter the holy of holies of what we have come to call the modern world. Freedom is the goal of all of our striving. Everyone wants it. Political freedom, economic freedom, free trade, free markets, freedom of speech, freedom of the press, religious freedom, freedom from fear, freedom from want. And the list could go on and on and on endlessly. Yet in spite of that desperate desire, freedom seems to be an elusive goal. Freedom's just another word for nothing left to lose, sings Janis Joplin in Me and Bobby McGee. When Bobby leaves her looking for a home, he's free. But that's just nothing. Nothing left to lose. It seems every advance in freedom on one front seems to bring exploitation on another. Our problem, as John's Gospel puts it, is that we're in the dark, even though we think we can see. I know you are children of Abraham, Jesus says, yet you seek to kill me, because my word finds no place in you. We think that the law is the remedy of sin. The law can do many things, many good things. It can preserve society. It can restrain evil. It can even cause us to go beyond our normal reach. But the law is no remedy for sin. The law actually makes sin worse, working in us either pride or despair. It shows us who we are. For no human being, says the Apostle Paul, will be justified in God's sight by the works of the law. Since through the law comes knowledge of sin. The fact is that we are free to do a lot of things. Free to eat and to drink, to clothe oneself, to buy a house or to keep cattle, to get married or to do whatever good pertains to this life including going to church, becoming religious, moral, or pious. What we are not free to do is to make ourselves right with God. Now the question is, if nothing stops us from doing what we want with earthly things, what stops us from reconciling ourselves with God? or at least to make some contribution if we want to. We tend to think of ourselves as those spiritual athletes just lusting to make God's team. The only problem is that we keep breaking the training rules, or that we're just not good enough, or strong enough, or fast enough. The fact is that the picture we tend to paint is incredibly false. Why can't we do it? Because deep down, we don't want to do it. When it comes to God, our wills are bound by some other faith, some other vision, and thus will not attend to the things of God. You see, we are at best ambivalent about God. We like the idea of God as an eternal source of love and truth and beauty and goodness. But there are other things we don't like at all. Things like God's almightiness, immutability, 
providence, predestination, election, in short, God's godness. We have trouble with such things because they don't seem to leave us any freedom. Here is where we are wrong. You see, the question isn't one of what's left over for our freedom after God has had God say. The question is rather one of what we have done with our freedom, the freedom we've been given. We have sold ourselves into a slavery from which there is no escape. And we have done it quite willingly. We are bound to do it. The will which is bound but thinks itself free will gobble up everything in its own self-serving machinery, however pious that machinery might be. This is the reason for the Reformation. This is the reason why justification by faith alone, by that divine decree, indeed by predestination and election, was so crucial to Martin Luther. Only if the one who is above us actually makes a move to save us do we have a chance. The good news that Martin Luther discovered is that God in Jesus Christ has done precisely that. God does not come to us because we're free and responsible. God comes to us because we're not. And God intends to make us so. He comes to set us free from our bondage, our illusions, our dreams, and our fictions, our enslavement to our own set of ideals. To find that freedom is, in fact, your God-given predestination. Since the law is no remedy for sin, God did something that only God could do. God created something new. God sent Jesus into the world to die at our hands, always so insistent on doing the law. Jesus came proclaiming, your sin is forgiven. That God has simply wiped out all distinctions between those who keep the law and those who don't. And we, we were so upset and unsettled that we killed him. Nevertheless, here's to something new. God raised him up from the dead, wiping out all doubts and debates and starting over in Christ Jesus. So there is simply nothing to do now but to listen. To listen to that creative word spoken into our darkness. You are just for Jesus' sake. And it doesn't matter whether you think you need it or not. It is the word of God. Amen.